Happy Friday afternoon. Thank you for joining me. I'm Jim with the Brewers Association of Maryland. I'm looking forward to a great chat today with uh, the brewing staff from Rockwell Brewery in Frederick. Uh, they've got a lot of great stuff to share with you and to talk about, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it. A couple of the folks at this brewery are near and dear to my heart, so uh, we'll have some fun chats, and I uh, think you guys will all appreciate the great stuff to come out of today's conversation. In the meantime, I want to thank everybody who uh, took the time to order Collab Project beer. Our sales for that uh, collaboration effort ended last night. To any of you who ordered four packs or cases, please know that your contributions to the Brewers Association are very much appreciated and you're helping us to keep this great uh, machine going, making sure that Maryland's craft beer industry is supported, uh, promoted, and has the right amount of advocacy behind the efforts that they need to keep their businesses going and going well. Uh, I also want to let everybody know that earlier this week, Governor Hogan did make a few updates to his executive orders. Um, real quickly, I'll cover what's going on around the state. Uh, the governor's executive order has reduced restaurant and bar capacity to 50%, and he would also like everybody to wear the damn mask. Uh, Baltimore City has an executive order that reduces restaurant capacity to 25%, and any uh, bar that does not have a moderate food facility license for indoor service uh, is not able to uh, be open to the public for on-premise consumption. So please reach out to your Baltimore City breweries, find out what their policies are and what their hours are based on that executive order. Uh, Anne Arundel County last night introduced uh, some guidance that says indoor capacity is limited to 25%, outdoor capacity limited to 75% of indoor capacity, and all alcohol sales must stop at 10 p.m. Uh, so that's active right now in Anne Arundel County. Check with your Anne Arundel breweries, see what they have going on and what their personal policies are to be in compliance. Montgomery County, uh, indoor capacity is reduced to 25%. Service ends at 10 p.m. And Frederick County uh, issued some mandates yesterday. 25% uh, capacity or 25 people, whichever is less, both indoor and outdoor. Um, this goes into effect this evening at 5 p.m. So if you're watching this, uh, today's Friday the 13th at 5 p.m. today, uh, these new guidelines go into effect. Um, this will affect every place that is alcohol service, um, essentially. So breweries, distilleries, tasting rooms at the wineries, um, any kind of event venue that has uh, access to alcohol. And this will actually roll over to weddings starting November 30th. Don't know how many of you are planning your nuptials, but it might be worth noting. All right. If you need any updates about that stuff, if you need any updates about what's going on with the Collab Project, Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, uh, and Twitter, and you can always visit MarylandBeer.org, and we'll have all of the updates there. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Scott McKernan and Andrew Boyd, both with Rockwell Brewery. Gentlemen, how are we doing today? Good. Wow, brother. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to join me this afternoon. Uh, that was like the longest intro I've had to do, almost four minutes of updates about what this crazy pandemic is causing uh, around the globe. So why don't we jump right into how guests can um, support Rockwell right now, and then we'll jump into the history of the brewery and uh, jump into your beers because we're, we're on the tail end of this COVID uh, update. So let's just go ahead and update with what you guys got going on. We've got lots of stuff in cans. Uh, so we recently got a wild goose canning line. We've got, uh, I think, four or five beers in cans right now. So obviously you can get uh, beer for carry out. Um, you know we do have outdoor and indoor, but it's it's limited. So <clears throat> um, you know, we're not going to be moving as much beer through the normal means, which mostly is through our tap room. So uh, we do, do do crowler sales also. Your guests can call in or uh, send orders to you guys virtually. Do you have the the means to do yeah, that? We, so they can curbside. We've been using the beer me for that. So yes, they can. Great. So uh, anybody who wants Rockwell beer, if you're worried about the limitations and restrictions that there will be on the number of people there, go ahead and place your beer me orders and uh, they'll get them filled for you. Um, so let's jump into it. Rockwell Brewery. A lot of people know it if they've been around Frederick over on the east side of the city. If they've uh, visited some of the other awesome establishments on that side of town, you've got some great eateries over there. Um, tell us a little bit about the history of the brewery and what you guys are, what you guys are doing in Frederick. Yeah, so we opened uh, in 2016. So no, 
yeah, coming up on four years. So it'll be in March. It'll be uh, four years. Um, so Matt and Paul opened up the brewery. Um, their friends that were homebrewers and decided they wanted to uh, take it a little bit further. So they started the uh, started the brewery, and then around I guess it was May, um, Paul contacted me through we we I met Paul through a mutual friend, and uh, he contacted me when I was working down at Growlers as a head brewer down there. And uh, wanted to know if I wanted to come work here for him. And uh, I live right down the street, so it was kind of a, a no-brainer, uh, seven blocks away. So, yeah, I started up here around, I guess it was June. And we were brewing originally on a little pilot system on the other side in the, uh, in the tap room, a little one-barrel pilot system, um, until we got the, the part, part of the building now where, the, um, where our main brewery is. Uh, we didn't have that originally. So once, uh, once we got the section of the building, uh, we got a three and a half barrel brew system from uh, Antietam. Uh, it was in Benny's Pub, and uh, we started brewing three and a half barrel batches with just three fermenters. And now we've gotten rid of all the little fermenters. And we're all it's we have seven seven barrel fermenters now, so we have to double batch every time we brew. Um, so it's a, a long brew day here, but uh, you know, that's, what, that's what we got to do. That's like a a fourteen fold increase on your production volume. Yeah. Right there. Well, it's nice to know that you need that amount of uh, that amount of capacity to satiate the demand of your your guests. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a pretty short period of time to make that jump. And you know, one of the things that we hear a lot about breweries who are kind of in the planning process right now, they all think that they can start small and eventually work their way in. And I think with the demand for craft beer and the way that the marketplace is shaped for people to uh, have such a high demand for new releases, uh, the guidance is probably. Think seven and then work your way up from there. Don't go anything smaller. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is a little, little small. We are limited by our space here. Uh, couldn't really fit much of a bigger system in. It'd be nice to have a, you know, a ten or fifteen or even a seven, but uh, you know, the space is limited. So. Well, yeah. I hadn't been I hadn't been in the brewing space there since uh, you expanded with the new equipment, and I have to say, you guys are running a nice, clean ship. Everything looks organized and and uh, and put together well, so it's not as though it's going to be too much of a hassle to get through there and have safety concerns. So that's always a pleasure when I can walk into a place and feel like something's not going to fall on me. Yeah, <laughs> you should see it once that. that uh, yeah, you should see it once that canning line rolls down in there, though. It gets uh, it gets a little tight. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. We're yeah. all going to have to go on diets in order to move around the place. Yeah. Matter of fact, I just pulled a bunch of uh, hardware off of these bright tanks over here so we can get by because. We have two little three and a half barrel bright tanks at Missa. I just use for cold liquor tanks in the summertime to have cold water because um, we unitank everything. Uh, so we don't really use these in the wintertime. So just having a couple extra inches, not having all these fittings and stuff and, and uh, thermometers sticking out of them helps us a lot. So tell me a little bit about kind of the uh, the philosophy behind the beer at Rockwell. When I look around Frederick, you guys uh, – you're unique because you're not pigeonholed into, not necessarily pigeonholed, but you're not tied to a style or an approach to style, it appears, that, that some of our our other local breweries are. We have breweries that are known really well for their fruited sours. We've got other folks who really are hanging on to what they can do with uh, hazy beers or their you know interpretations of older styles. You guys are kind of putting everything out there, and it seems like it's working to be a great draw for people. Yeah, I mean, we love to brew... Uh different stuff and we kind of have something for everybody i mean if you want a lager we usually have a lager on tap um if you want a, a new england ipa hazy new england which are real popular right now we've got that we usually have a sour um we're kind of all over the place i've got um you know a, a scottish we heavy coming up soon um an imperial ipa coming excuse me an imperial stout coming soon we, we try and have a, a really good variety of uh of beer so if you come here you're pretty much going to find something you like, and we even have done uh, a few seltzers too. So. That's awesome, and you guys are distributing a little bit throughout Frederick and uh, a little bit beyond that, right? Yeah, I mean, just just self distributing and some restaurants. I mean, not so much right now uh, with COVID, but uh, you know, we're in some restaurants. We do have some places that carry our cans, um, but we're not really trying to trying to push it right now. It's because we have we produce so little beer. It's like we rather we want to have our tap room. That's kind of our main our main customer for our tap room. So we want to have people come in here. We want to have beer for them to drink and to carry out. 
And one of the big things you guys have been doing over the last couple of years is really working on that outdoor space, making that very habitable, making it a place that people really want to hang out and uh, having it be a welcome respite. And I think right now during COVID, you guys probably have one of the uh, the best hidden gems for outdoor space and probably all of Frederick when it comes to the beer scene. Oh yeah, it's like this, and it's it's changed a lot since we've been here. We we originally had just a little metal fence, we expanded that, and then we added the cedar fence over top of that and uh, added more seating. Um, we're getting ready to put in two, two permanent natural gas heaters over the covered area where we have bands and stuff play there sometimes when uh, we're allowed to do that. So um, yeah, and eventually we'll do something with the asphalt to make it not look like a parking lot. Um, but yeah, it's it's come a long way in a in few years we've been open. You gonna make a green space? Do we get some AstroTurf? Uh, play some hockey? I, I, <laughs> Let's put down some, some real grass or maybe a couple dump trucks full of sand out there or something. Oh, there you go. We actually were at uh, Franklin's a few weeks ago down in Hyattsville, and he put in this corn tiki bar, and he actually brought in a bunch of sand and dumped it out there and put a fence around it. And nice. man, it's such a cool environment to be in that town, and all of a sudden you're sitting in like this sand lounge like you're on the beach. So it, there yeah, might be some good options there. Get, get a sand volleyball team going. Yeah, there's a brewery in uh, – I think it's Leesburg. It's got some. They've got like a boat outside and sand, and you sit around the, the boats of our. Oh, that's very cool. Uh, anybody who's tuning in this afternoon that has any questions for the team at Rockwell, please throw them into the chat. We can see you both on uh, comments on Facebook and comments on YouTube. We'd love to hear from you and have you be a part of the conversation, uh, even if it's just to tell us what your favorite beer is at Rockwell or something that you uh, wanted to share with these guys. Uh, we're happy to have it on the uh, on the chat. So. Um, Scott, personally for you, you've been brewing for several years. I know you've got a great background as a home brewer, a professional experience. What is it that you really enjoy about brewing, and what are you bringing to the table at Rockwell in terms of your personal philosophy behind beer? Um, I think I think the, the variety in, is uh, a big part of it. I like doing a lot of different stuff, um, and. Uh, you know, I like to drink different kinds of beers. I like to have uh, and brew different kinds of beers. But it's just you do the same thing over and over again. It's just not fun. You know, we have a lot of flexibility here, like I was talking about before, with the, with the different styles. Um, you know, we're constantly trying out different stuff. Uh, sorry, I just had an update pop up on my computer that I had to get out of the way. Couldn't see you for a second. Um, <laughs> And Andrew, you're fairly new there. Why don't you give a little bit about your background and uh, what what you're doing now in the brewery with Scott and uh, kind of what you're you're hoping to bring to the table? Sure. So I got really lucky. Uh, I basically got out of college and had uh, no idea what I was going to do with my life. And uh, I got a job moving kegs uh, for, for Brewers Alley in Monocacy. Uh, so I, I moved kegs around. I did deliveries for a while. And uh, eventually, you know, just kind of got involved in retail tastings and eventually, you know, selling it and working the beer festivals and, uh, you know, doing draft maintenance, you know, getting, you know, my hands on, you know, jockey boxes and breaking them down. And, uh, was really fortunate to be around a lot of people that just knew, uh, a lot about craft beer and had dedicated, you know, their lives to it and had been professionally trained. And, uh, you know, they let me just pick their brain and I kind of have just continued to just talk to people who uh who know a lot more than i do about beer and just try to try to learn everything i can um so when i found out that there may be an opportunity you know to get back into the production side of things which is really the only side of the industry i hadn't really had a chance to get my hands on um you know i thought it, it was a really logical next step uh for me so you know i just wanted to kind of come in help scott out you know i i met scott through a mutual friend um I knew he was a good guy. Um, you know, I liked hanging out with him. Um, and I, I'd really, I hadn't really had a lot of his beer yet. And, you know, when I got in there and I started trying everything, you know, I was like, <laughs> these are all so good. I mean, the guy just makes really, really fantastic beer. Um, and then I got really excited. I was like, all right, this is, I'm stoked. Not only to be back in a brewery and learning, you know, the production side of things, but, um, you know, just being able to pick his brain um, you know, poor Scott barely gets to breathe in the brew without me asking why he did that. Um, <laughs> every, every valve, every, every, every clamp. Yeah. I mean, I just, it, it, it's so new to me still. 
Um, you know, I'm just trying to pick up on every, every little thing. Um, so it, it's been a lot of fun. I mean, I, all I hope I can bring to the table is I have a pretty, uh, pretty versatile background. I've done a little bit of everything in, in the, in the business until, you know, this now production side of things. Um, I've seen a lot of beer. I've talked to a lot of beer people. I've had a ton of interactions with the consumer. Um, and I think that bringing that information, you know, to a brewery that's making really solid beer, I think it's beneficial for all of us. I do think that that's a really good point. There are a lot of uh, times that we have conversations with folks who know everything there is to know about the production, but they may not know what it takes to get the beer into the market, or they may not have the the sense of what the consumer might be feeling because there sometimes can be that detachment between the tasting room and the production side. Um, so it's nice to have somebody who's got a little bit of background there and, you know, the, the ability to say, Hey, I think that there may be a, a pulse that we're missing or something like that. So that's pretty cool. And uh, full disclosure to anybody who's watching, if Andrew and I joke around a little bit uh, and it doesn't make any sense, he's my brother-in-law. I'm fortunately married to his sister and uh, I'm very proud of it. I actually, I have, their wedding photo oh, right right here behind me. This is, this is my little cousin, but this is them. They're sweet. So uh, I'm very proud of Andrew. I'm happy to see him uh, at Rockwell. He's going to be a great asset for them. And I think he's landed with an awesome team of people to help give him some, uh, some opportunities for the future in this industry. So let's talk about beer. You guys uh, were really excited to share the very first beer that you brought up, the seltzer with me. Why don't we talk about that and let everybody know what you're doing with this seltzer? So I, I love the idea of craft seltzer. Um, I love beer. I, I'm really an equal equal opportunity alcoholic beverage consumer. Um, there's nothing better than getting home from a hard day of cleaning kegs, jumping in the shower, and cracking open a seltzer. Um, it's refreshing. They're light. Um, you know, they're just easy. Uh, you know, when you drink beer almost professionally and you're always analyzing things and you're, you know, grabbing a seltzer, it, they're almost – they're not simple – but they're just, it's a little less thought that has to go into it when you're drinking it. So if you just want to hang out and, you know, crush something light and flavorful, um, you know, it, it, it does the trick. Um, I know they're not everybody's cup of tea, um, but it's a great option to have. And the fact that, you know, as brewers, we can, we can make that and have that as an option in the tap room to just serve another consumer who may, you know, really haven't found their style yet. They don't know what beer is the beer that's going to do it for them, get them into craft beer. Um, you know, seltzers, it's kind of a, it's a nice step into getting, you know, closer and closer into, you know, really finding what, what's going to be your groove. I think that during the summer too, this is the, uh, beverage that people are flocking to due to the fact that, you know, there's this idea about fewer calories, fewer carbs, all this kind of stuff. The health conscious millennial is a little bit more interested in drinking spirits than they are beer a lot because they're worried about, you know, what the waistline waistline is going to look like and, and the cheeks. So um, I, I definitely see that this is not a trend that's going to be going away anytime soon. I think that this is a, a real shift in what people's potential craft drinking habits are going to look like is this appeal to the seltzer drinker and we see it popping up at craft breweries throughout the state um one of the things that we were chatting about a little bit ahead of time is that not all of these craft seltzers tend to uh be packaged or introduced to the consumer with the most appealing aromatics or flavor profiles what are you guys doing to make this seltzer so palatable and uh delicious uh <laughs> I'm not as big a fan of the of seltzers. <laughs> um, I mean, we we use fruit puree in it, so that's uh, that's what's going to give it its flavor. I mean, it's, that's pretty much the only flavor in it. It's just basically uh, fermented sugar water, and then we've used various kinds of puree, um, various kinds of puree. Like this is a you know lemon lime. We've done uh, mango and did a blackberry one. Um, I think. I mean, I think the blackberry one was. Pretty uh, I don't really drink them. I mean, I can understand people like them. It's something else for when people come here sometimes for events and they're not beer drinkers, and it's just another option that we're allowed to serve. So you know, it's a nice, it's nice to have it here. Yeah, one of the things that we've noticed coming up is that you don't want the experience at the brewery to be uh, exclusionary to anybody. You know, you want to have that ability for anybody to walk in and feel like they have an opportunity to enjoy what you're doing and be a part of the crowd. So 
uh, yeah. that fills that spot. And we see that happening with some ciders also. You know, people are trying to play around with how they can get cider on the menu, and uh, it seems to be working out pretty well. Um, is that 12 ounce can? Yeah, 12 ounce can. It, it does hit that that uh, health centric. Uh, you know, it's it's in that hundred calorie you know ballpark. Um, so I mean, it's it's definitely a good option. You know, if that's something that you know you're you're looking for in your beverage. Um, and that's in 12 ounce cans, six packs. Do you guys six, do, those, do you guys do those as crowlers too? If somebody comes in, or do you serve them in cans to get? Yeah, it's only cans right now. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. We did have it on uh, on tap at one time or out of the, the draft version. Makes sense. All right. Um, now we can move to the beer, Scott. We got the seltzer out of the way. It's time to talk about Sounds good. Talk about grain-based uh, uh, alcoholic beverages. You ready? All righty. I can it. already tell you're more into this. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the lineup you gave me, you guys said that uh, Big Juicy, your New England IPA, was going to be the next one to talk about. Let's uh, Big Juicy, yeah, yeah. One of our most popular beers. I love the colors on the can for anybody who's not seen it. Yeah, and that uh, that artwork was done. And pardon me for uh, for referring to to notes, but I don't want to I don't want to get stuff wrong. That's uh, the artwork was done by a friend of uh, Matt, one of the owners. Um, his name is Bernard Rollins. Uh, you can find him at Bernard Artwork uh, on Instagram. Uh, so shout out to him. Yeah, it's great art. Awesome can. Um, does he do most of the label artwork, or is the label artwork done through different artists? Actually, uh, we just recently hired a director of marketing, uh, Quinn, uh, and she has taken uh, the reins. She's done the packaging for the the last three beers, um, two that we'll be looking at a little bit later here today, and then uh, the the ones that we're going to ready to can next week. She's she's working on those as well. That's awesome. It's pretty cool to have that ability in house. I know, especially in Frederick, it's like the same four or five artists are kind of getting the. Uh, hit up on a on a freelance basis at most of the breweries so it's kind of cool to see somebody who's kind of tied to one place yeah she's been a she's been a great great pickup that's for sure she's awesome so tell us about big juicy what's this beer all about aside from being very tasty so this is actually the very first beer that we brewed here on this side it wasn't in the pilot system so um, and it has changed a lot since i first brewed this um, so this is not only my first beer I brewed here, it's my first New England I brewed. And I had no idea how to brew New England IPA with that one. It's, I had the hardest time making this, the haze stable. And uh, I had to kind of rethink the brewing process. because Some of the things I was doing were things I've been doing forever that don't really apply to this beer, like using wool flock, which is a kettle finding, which you don't want to use in a New England IPA because it's going to, you know, drop out a lot of that um, that haze. So, yeah, that's a big no-no. <laughs> so, yeah, the first uh, batch of Big Juicy was pretty clear, and it's it's a totally different beer now. This is like the – I think I've changed the recipe about seven times. It's got the same um, hops as it originally did, the Mosaic, Citra, and Mandarin Bavaria. Um, pretty much the, the grain bill has changed quite a bit. And uh, now, now it's exactly – you know, where I want it to be. It has been for a while, and so it's it's going to stay as is now. But, uh, yeah, that's it's been around for almost uh, a little over three years now. We, we I do uh, I do have to say I'm not the biggest fan of the hazies, but I get my hands on them all the time just because it seems to be the biggest thing in beer right now, and every brewery you go to is offering at least a half dozen of them. So, yeah. um <laughs> I, I really, what I find most fascinating about this is you've maintained such a very nice balance of bitterness with a really nice standout grain character that you don't always find. Sometimes it's just, you know, kind of overly sweet or um, yeah. feels as though that juiciness is the only thing that you're getting. This really, really does have a nice fine background to it. And I think that that's very complimentary. So good job on that. Oh, thank you. Glad you um, yeah, when I... Go ahead, Andrew. I've had the I've had the 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 privilege of trying a lot of hazy nipas, um, especially in the last you know two years or so. I mean, I, I've had a couple from every single brewery that that makes them. Um, then it was getting to the point where I think there are a lot of others who kind of share the sentiment. When I came on board at Rockwell, the last thing I wanted to drink was another hazy or a nipa, uh, and then I tried you know the latest batch of Big Juicy. It was actually the first beer 
uh, it was the first brew day, my first actual brew day there. We were brewing big juicy. Uh, so I had like this, this new connection to this beer that, that I hadn't had previously. Uh, it, the, the balance that it strikes, um, the way that it's not overwhelming in any, you know, real one direction. Um, I think, you know, as, as far as flavor profiles go, if you can, you know, keep it a nice, you know, round flavor profile, you know, no real sharp edges. I mean, I think it just goes a long way. Um, and I mean, this beer, it slaps. I mean, there's very few people who get this beer in their hands and don't go, wow, this is really good. I would agree with that. This is a, it's a very, very nice expression of this style. And I think you guys have nailed it. I don't, don't doubt that you have a lot of people coming in asking for it. It almost never lasts on tap. It's it's <laughs> insane. It's it sells so ridiculously fast. We were pretty um, much have to brew it constantly. We had never had our last brewing meeting. We decided that's what we're we're just going to have one fermenter, basically. Well, not just one fermenter, but we're, we're always going to have it in process because it just runs out so fast. We have cans now, so if you listen to this and you want some, pick up the cans because they're going to go quick. It even says so on their website. I <laughs> double checked. It says this will not last. It they know you know. Sweet. <laughs> so, this seems to be your entree into uh, your tie to the creative art of music and beer. Um, and I know Scott, you and I have been friends on Facebook for a long time. We've we've interacted socially every once in a while. I know that you're a huge fan of music, Andrew. Obviously, oh. you are a huge music fan, as am I. Um, Tell me a little bit about that tie to creativity and music and how it's inspiring you through what you're doing and, and why you appreciate kind of pinning your beers to different types of uh, to musical genres and approaches. Well, that's actually not something that, that I originally did. That's that's kind of Matt and Paul's thing. And uh, the way the, the way Rockwell Brewery, the, the word God's name is because Paul also is, uh, builds guitars. So he's got a rock, Rockwell guitar um, also is, is his business. And so that's kind of where the whole music thing started. Of course, I mean, Andrew and I are also big music fans. We're jamming music in there all the time. And uh, so, yeah, we, uh, a lot of the names, uh, a lot of the names come from songs, or, or lyrics from various songs. I mean, there's a lot of clutch stuff because that's one of my favorite bands. So you'll see a lot of like, we have a, we have a Neep on Tap called Cyborg Betty. That's a clutch song. In fact, one of their band members is our regular customer here. So, uh, yeah, it's we we do a lot of a lot of stuff. A lot of names of the uh, the beers come from from music. That's awesome. I didn't know that uh, Paul was a luthier. That's awesome. Yeah, his yep. shop is legit. Like some of the guitars that I've I've seen that he's made are. are really really impressive well now i'm way less interested to come and hang out there i want to go hang out at Paul's <laughs> yeah, right, right, right it's a pretty groovy spot man i tell people i own guitars i play them for my daughter but i'm not good so yeah <laughs> yeah I when, the uh, when i was picking when i when i first came on i was kind of picking you know paul's brain about you know where the name came from and you know what you know why the connection to all the all the music you know one of the things that he kind of you know really hit on was that Music tends to bring people together. Beer tends to bring people together. Uh, beer in silence is kind of depressing sometimes. Beer with music is a good time. Usually, you know, makes for a good party. So, uh, you know, just kind of the camaraderie that that comes through, you know, creating, you know, music, crafting music, crafting, you know, his guitars, and you know, making beer, crafting beer, and kind of, you know, bringing the two together, and uh, just for kind of, you know, making a, a fun hang. Matthew. Ricky would like to know if Big Greasy is available anywhere outside of Maryland. Uh, Matthew, I don't know where you are. Throw it in the comments and we'll find out. But I have a feeling that it's probably a Maryland-only release. Yeah, yeah. It's not available anywhere uh, really outside of Frederick, not even Maryland. Is. We don't we don't really try to, to even we – we're just too small. We just don't try and distribute it anywhere else. And uh, I mean, maybe someday down the line when we have a production facility, we'll, we'll look into that. But just we just can't do it right now. Um, so thinking a little bit about the scale of what you guys are doing in your capacity there, um, seems like you'd be outgrowing that space very quickly. What are you doing for some of the volume that you can't keep up with there? Uh, we do occasionally brew up at Antietam also. So we have a, a blonde ale called Rapture. It's also gluten-free. <clears throat> well, excuse me, gluten-removed. I guess I can't really technically call it gluten-free, but uh, 
Um, that's our, our blonde ale, and we go through a lot of that. Uh, so we did a, a big batch up at Antietam a couple weeks ago, and that should be ready probably next week. So we, we've done Big Juicy there a couple times too, but that's primarily we do that here. And Scott, what do you think about kind of doing those contract relationships? Is that something that you enjoy? Is it nice to have the ability to kind of use that relief valve and get, get beer made that you know needs to be made somewhere where there's capacity? And do you find that it's okay to work with other brewers to get that stuff done? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, I love those guys. They're awesome. Uh, and I go up there and we bring ingredients from here. We use their silo malt. We bring all our ingredients out and we stay there and, uh, for the brew day. And uh, you know, just work with them. Uh, so yeah, I, I like. It, it'd be nice to be able to do everything ourselves, but it's just being this small, we just can't do it. It's just we just can't make enough beer in this little space. Um, we do. We do have to look to them every once in a while on beers like that. that we just move so much of. It definitely makes sense. We have a lot of uh, breweries in the state who have either started with you know full contract or big big loads of their production were handled under contract in other places, and then uh, you know they they step in where they can to bring it back into their own house, or they keep those contracts going, and it, it seems to work out for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, I look forward to having Antietam on one day because they're doing a lot of production for a lot of different labels, and I think it's really fascinating how they built their business up from their own brand. To kind of be a place to get a quality beer out for a lot of people at, at one time. Yeah, those are great guys out there. The they have a, that space is enormous. Uh, I was blown away when I went out there a couple of weeks ago and toured around with Bill. Um, just seeing the scale of what they're doing is fascinating. Knowing where they came from, so that's it's it's exciting. All right, um, let's roll into another great beer. Yesterday, I did a really really cool chat with a bunch of distillers. Uh, we talked about Maryland whiskey, the history of bourbon and how it actually originated. The original bourbon recipes probably originated here in Maryland that followed uh, folks like Basil Hayden out to, well, at the time was Western Virginia, but now Kentucky. Um, and and rye was a big, big part of that story. So tell us oh, a little yeah. bit about uh, No Woman More Rye. Okay, yeah, so this is our, our most recent uh, rye IPA. Uh, it's uh, hop with an Amarillo, Amarillo Northern Brewer and Magnum. So this uh, nice this can design, flavor. all done in house. Yeah, this is one of my favorites. Uh, real quick, while you guys are pouring your sip to taste, some some interloper named Paul would like to know who your favorite partner or owner is involved in the business. Uh, I that refuse means, to answer that question on the grounds that it may incriminate me. Hey, Paul, if you didn't watch a few minutes ago, I'm still waiting for my invitation to your guitar shop, man. I'll, uh, I'll say whichever one didn't just ask me to go do something. There you go. Fair enough. They're both great guys. Seriously, um, they're we're excellent people to work for. They they get it. Um, very laid back, really relaxed. They're they're both really great. I'm I'm, I'm happy to work for them. Really, am. even though they change my beer names all the time. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about No Woman More Rye. Uh, what are we using ingredient wise? What's the grist bill look like? Uh, this one is. Let me see. <clears throat> I think it's twenty six percent rye, but don't make don't make me lie here. Let's see. It's got a good balance of it though, that's for sure. I've had, you know, some out there where you can't really get it, um, or maybe it's way too much rye and there really isn't enough of that, you know, hot presence to really kind of come through. But um this is we were we were just running out of this when I started. Um, and I was, I was really blown away at, at how good it was. So I was excited, you know, when we got to, you know, rebrew it and get it in cans. I got Flatfoot Sam banging on the door out here. Oh, of course. <laughs> um, 
So I, I didn't bring it up on the last one. We kind of answered Matt's question about whether or not uh, Big Juicy was available outside of the state or outside of Frederick, but uh, it is available in 16-ounce cans in the tasting room, correct, in four packs? It is. Yep. No woman, more rye. Mm-hmm. Great. Um, what what kind of space on the tap board is this, is this filling for your consumer? Is this somebody who's looking just for an all-around great kind of malt-forward, but balanced beer. I mean, I've had this beer a couple of times. I find it to be a really intriguing drink. It doesn't seem to be out of balance in in the way of bitterness. It doesn't seem to be out of balance in the way of like cloying sweetness or spice from the rye, like Andrew said. Um, so is it just there to be your your stand up middle of the road drinker for everybody? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's I don't think everybody likes rye beers, but uh, it's one of my favorite. Styles, and uh, we've done a few different ones. Um, we started off with, uh, I think it was one of, I think one of Larry Larry's recipes uh, before I started here. We had a one called Rye Stone Cowboy, and um, ever since we had that, we've always had some kind of rye beer. We brewed that a few times, and then uh, I started doing some some rye IPAs. That was more like a pale ale, and doing the, the higher ABV ones. Uh, so we've kind of always had one on tap, and uh, I think I mean, if you like IPAs, you probably like it. But, uh, it's hard to deny our love for rye whiskey and yeah. not see how how that like we we're not distillers, I mean, we're we're brewing, but I know we both love rye whiskey. So you know, being able to get a little bit of that that rye spice, you know, into something that we can make, um, it's definitely you know a nice addition, you know. You could you could throw up a West Coast, you could throw up an American IPA, you know. But you know, knowing the great history that Maryland has with producing rye, um, it's just it's nice to just feature you know a rye a rye IPA. Yeah, I uh, I find that that style is one that is uh, kind of all over the map, and people you know attribute well IPA is all over the map. So let's be honest about that. And then when we talk about you know how do we categorize what the rye IPA is, what's appropriate in terms of rye impact on the uh, the aroma and the taste. Um, but I really think that you guys are finding a good balance there and you're bringing something to the table that I think a lot of people can appreciate, even if they don't necessarily think they would love a rye, a rye beer. Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of people, when they hear the word rye, they immediately think of the bread. And, you know, when you take a big old bite of rye bread, you know, a lot of what you're getting is, you know, the other spices that are in the bread. Um, I actually think that, you know, in rye beers and in rye whiskey, you're, you're able to see a better representation of what the grain is actually bringing to the table, um, you know, than, than when you get that. So I think that uh, allowing people to, to taste it and to, to differentiate the fact that, you know, a rye beer doesn't mean it's going to taste like, you know, caraway or pumpernickel. You know, it's going to it's its own kind of, you know, unique spice flavor that can really bring a lot to a hot profile, uh, especially, you know, when when done well. Absolutely. Uh, and then it looked like you guys had one more on the list. This one I have a feeling is inspired by music, but I'm not positive. Yeah, I think you're. I think you're pretty safe to bet that one. Oh, yeah. yes. I noticed earlier Scott was wearing a Dropkick Murphys hoodie, so I'm all about that. Too. <laughs> so tell us about Dropkick Irish Red. Uh, you're one of. Very few breweries that I can immediately have come to mind that is offering a, an Irish red. And it seems like this is around pretty frequently, right? Pops in and out. Yeah, and it's, uh, one of our regular beers that we pretty much try to have on year round. It's got a pretty good following. Um, but uh, yeah, we've probably had this for at least three years or so now. Um, we did. We did another beer here too with uh, it's called uh, I can't remember the name. We did, can't remember the name of the beer now, but uh, it was a it was an Irish red ale that we did as a stone like a stone beer. It was a collaboration with barley and hops and uh, Bold Mother and Mad Science, and we set up a brew kettle outside and threw stones into a one barrel brew kettle to bring it to a boil and then pumped it into the main brew house. And that that recipe is actually what this is. It's pretty much the same recipe as that. I just I like that one better than the original drop kick, so that ended up becoming the new drop kick. <laughs> oh, very cool. Yeah. So yeah, 
the fact that there's always more or less always the Irish red on tap and then uh, also uh, the speed of darkness, which is the dry Irish stout on nitro. Um, you know, two great not IPA styles that are still relatively light, easy to crush. Um, I mean, it just it's just fantastic to have around. Um, you know, I, I think you sometimes go into places and you're kind of inundated with, you know, hops and your fruit sours. And while those beers absolutely have a place, you know, in lineups, it's nice to have beers that, you know, it's, it's a little more malt forward, but they're still light. They're still, they're still easy to drink. Um, I'm not sure a day has gone by since we've had the dry Irish stout back on nitro, uh, that Scott and I haven't at least had one a day. Um, Keeps the body. I wish healthy. we had that in cans, but uh, <laughs> I know we were just talking about yeah. that. We we're like, well, if we had. Yeah, just we do have yeah, yeah, but it's just great, you know. Uh, an Irish red, you know, easily overlooked. Um, but if you like beer and you want something that's going to drink well, um, you know, and just kind of be a, a sort of divergence from what's very popular right now, I mean, you, you can't look for a better beer. Yeah, I, uh, I benefited from. Andrew dropping one of these off with me the other day. And uh, I have to say, man, I, I sat back with this beer and I'm thinking this is this is a oh. lovely, lovely sipper. It's got all of the malt character that you're looking for. Really great balance. Um, you know, I think you guys executed it really, really well. And for kind of a style that not a lot of people either appreciate or approach, um, just because, you know, they look at it and they say, oh, the only experience I have is Killian's or something like that. Um, this is this is phenomenal, and it really kind of harkens back to what great quaffable beer is all about. Mm -hmm. This is actually a little bit out of out of style for an Irish red. It's uh, a little little darker than it's supposed to be, but it's got a pretty good amount of roasted barley in it. And I can't really make it any lighter in color, and still use the same amount of roasted barley. So it's just that's the way it is. <laughs> Yeah, I did notice that it was leaning a little bit more like heel wise towards maybe a porter or something, but I still, the the, the yeah. flavor that you've got is nailed it right on. And, uh, you know, it brings the right amount of, of that just like touch of sweetness that makes you feel very happy that you have a nice malt forward beer. And then you can drink it all day without wearing the palate out. So very good stuff. Very cool beer. Um, and that one, again, is 16 ounce cans available in the tasting room. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Everything yeah. going forward should be a 16 ounce can. Um, you know, we got that wild goose, uh, candy line. Uh, I can't, can't say enough about that, uh, that and, you know, wild goose, they were fantastic. Um, uh, goose is loose Jose on, uh, on Instagram. Uh, he was fantastic. He came out, you know, gave us the rundown, um, you know, told us, you know, what, what to look for, for preventative maintenance and everything, you know, really, really hands on. Um, and I, I'm, I'm grateful for that because man, First time we fired that bad boy up without him, it was, we were all sweating bullets a little bit. It was it was an interesting day because uh, we <laughs> couldn't remember what the hell we were doing. Yeah, I mean we, I took notes, I took pictures, and I mean we we plugged it in and flipped the levers, and we were like, oh, crap. it didn't do it. It's what do we do? What do we do? I mean it's it's an art, man. I mean every everything as a, if you're a beer consumer, you got to understand that that absolutely everything that goes into producing that can or filling that keg is an absolute art form. And it's definitely not to be overlooked for how difficult it is to do very well repeatedly, you know, all the time. Um, so that, that canyon line, I mean, it's, it's a beast, you know, I mean, once, once you get it dialed in, I mean, it, it really, it's, it's rocking. It's, it's pretty great, but um, getting ready to can, you know, two more things, uh, you know, next week, um, you know, we're really hoping that, you know, that'll, that'll help kind of, uh, balance some things out with some of the new restrictions that have just come down, you know, for what we can do as far as the outdoor space and the tap room space. Is it too early to talk about the cans that you're going to be releasing next week? No, I don't think so. It's, uh, we're waiting on labels for Cyborg Betty, which uh, we have on tap here right now. That's one of our new ones. Um, and we've got the, uh, our double IPA, a new double IPA called uh, power and passion. That's with, uh, with Southern passion and mosaic. Yeah, so 9.6% 9, 9 double IPA. Sounds awesome. Really uh, smooth, yeah. Mm -hmm. Timmy on Facebook would like to know if there's a consensus across your team's favorite style of beer or if you guys just want to share your favorite style. I love, like Andrew said, that, that uh, Speed of Darkness, which is our dryer stout. I mean, I, I love dryer stouts. Um, I love Guinness. In fact, I got engaged in the Guinness Brewery in Dublin. So. Oh, well, there you go. 
and my wife uh, had her first pint of beer there too. So I uh, pint of, uh, of Guinness or Dryer Stout. So yeah, you, I love you, you, IPAs. If you asked me this question a year ago, six months ago, it, it would constantly change. Um, it used to be a huge hop head. Um, I fell in love with, you know, crazy barrel aged sours, you know, those still hold a special place for me. Um, when I started at Rockwell, I mean, I was, I was at a point where I was like, if it's not a lager, if I can't see through it, don't hand it to me. I don't want it. I want nothing to do with it. Uh, and then I tried Scott's speed of darkness, the dry iris stout, and it, it totally changed my mind. I have a, a very dear friend of mine who works at the Guinness, uh, open gate facility and, I think every time I've seen him since he started there, he's handed me a Guinness and, and I would, I would try to love it as much as he did. Um, and I, it, it just never, it just, I just never quite, you know, tipped the scale for me to be like, Oh my goodness, I get it. Like, this is why, but man, I tell you what, there's nothing better than after a hard day's work, pouring yourself a dryer stout on nitro and just taking that first sip and getting that, getting that gnarly nitro mustache and just, it's crisp, it's clean, it's light. It's got a ton of flavor. Um, I mean, I've, I've absolutely fallen in love now with, with dryer stouts on, on nitro, which is something that I never would have guessed I would ever say. So one of the limitations year round. Yeah. Year round. Yeah. Round. yeah. yeah. Round year round. yeah. Which, a couple of times, but we try and always keep it on tap. We always have a nitro line with, uh, with that on it. Now, one of the limitations to that is that it's not an easy beer to package for carry out service, right? So that's no. something the guest is going to have to get to the tasting room. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. better be one of the one of the twenty five people that's able to uh, sidle up to a, a chair there and uh, get yourself a pour yeah. of feet of darkness. Yeah, I just wanted to take a sec. It looks like uh, Anthony was giving us uh, some love. Thank you, Anthony. Please pick up some beer. I don't want to. I don't think I had a chance to to say thanks for that, man. But I appreciate you, brother. Thanks, Timmy, and thanks, Matt. Um, if you guys want to chat a little bit more about some things that you see coming down the pike, what do you see uh, on the horizon for Rockwell in the next few months? I know these guidelines are a little different, but are there any cool projects you're working on? Any uh, styles that you're really trying to go after? we got a couple projects I think we're going to try to get into barrels. Um, Scott brewed a tremendously large imperial stout um, that is uh, – it's going to be fantastic. I can't wait to try it. And we're trying to drop that bad boy into a barrel. Um, I named after you. <laughs> so he he sends me this text and he's like, I named this beer after you. It's called American Taurus, Taurus Tourist Gorilla. And I was like, what? That, that makes, makes – I, I had no idea what it was. So I Google it and there's this 1970s like luggage ad that's got this this gorilla just beating the bejesus out of this this piece of luggage. And I was like, I don't get it. This can't be what he's talking about. And I come into work the next day, and I was like, is this what you were talking about? And he, goes, he goes, yeah, because you break everything. And I was like, what if I broke it? <laughs> Apparently, uh, I'm a little bullish. Uh, I, I, don't, I think I have a lot of finesse. Um, uh, Strength. Yeah, apparently, I, I, I can break we've, we've both been graced with fat guy finesse, Andrew. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, well, since you don't have a whole bevy of things to offer in terms of future your projects. Michael from YouTube has suggested maybe some milk stouts or cream ales. Yeah, we have a, a regular milk stout that we uh, we're out of it right now. It's been been down for a little while just because we have we have a couple stouts up anyway. So it, it'll probably be coming back. It's called uh, Bitch Camaro, and that's uh, that, that's a that's six and a half percent or so of milk stout. Well, there you go, Michael. Looks like you have a reason to visit, aside from the uh, the awesome sounding dry Irish nitro nitro pour. You can uh, get yourself some uh, bitch and Camaro, and then uh, another person in the comments who I love a whole lot, my mother in law and Andrew's mom, wants everybody to be able to get together, and she wants to come to Rockwell and drink beer. Thanks, mom. Um, so what do you guys see going on for Maryland beer in the next few months? Do you see anything happening for uh, for the industry as a whole? Do you see any big shifts that the association should be aware of <clears throat> lots of canning <laughs> lots of canning yeah, yeah lots of canning. uh yeah it's it seems like everybody in town now has got a canning line of some sort and uh you know with the with the restrictions um and with winter right around the corner and we're you know we're all gonna lose our outdoor areas for the most part when winter hits most people want to sit out there in 33 weather drinking 
maybe some people probably will um but yeah there's gonna be a lot more packaging i think and uh carry out beer delivery absolutely uh again these guys are available to have their beer ordered through beer me please place your orders uh with them this weekend show your support for your favorite local maryland brewery if you've not visited rockwell uh there's no time like the present so place your order get out there and show them your love uh if you're curious what you can do to support maryland beer and maryland's brewing industry not only can you uh tune in next friday to our fermented friday but you can hang on for the after show uh, when we drop a whole bunch of really great videos that we've put together with some of our friends over the last few weeks to complement your collab project beer purchases and i would also ask if you've got a few minutes to reach out to your senators uh, in Washington, D.C., and ask them to pass the Craft Beverage Modernization and Tax Reform Act. Uh, this is something that's going to impact all of our state's breweries. On December 31st, 2020, we are going to see an expiration of tax relief that uh, all of our breweries pay on excise taxes. You know, when that expires, we'll be seeing tax rates go up across the industry for breweries throughout the country. So please reach out to uh, your senator here in the state and ask them to get their support behind the Craft Beverage Modernization and Tax Reform Act uh, as soon as possible. Uh, we need to have the, uh, the Congress take some action on this. They've done a lot to offer this relief over the last few years, but it is not permanent and it is something that will kind of change what the landscape looks like and not necessarily for the better. So uh, if you're civically minded, please do that. Uh, show your support for your favorite local Maryland brewer. Say thanks again to uh, Scott and Andrew. You guys are great. Keep doing great things. Keep putting out awesome beers. Check them out on uh, Instagram, all the socials. Andrew, do you have all the handles off your top of your head? Uh, at Scott McKernan, uh, at Disco Wombat, uh, at Rockwell Brewing. Um, everything. Check us out on Facebook. Um, there's going to be you know some definite shuffling you know with some events that we had planned. Um, you know, Quinn, our director of marketing is doing a great job keeping our Facebook and our website up to date. Uh, so, you know, find Rockwell Brewing on Facebook, give us a like, um, rockwellbrewery.com, uh, for updates to the website. Um, and I just wanted to give a shout out to, you know, everyone who's been uh, a fantastic supporter of Maryland craft beer, uh, without the consumer, you know, we don't, we don't have a reason to go to work in the morning. Um, and you know, the, the craft beer community in Maryland, especially Frederick, I mean, it's just been it's just been fantastic to be a part of. Um, so thanks everybody uh, for supporting craft beer. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for giving us a, a good reason to to go to work and put our boots on. Be sure to uh, follow Rockwell Brewery on Instagram. Rockwell Brewing takes you to a brewery in Southern Illinois near where I grew up. So don't follow those guys unless you're interested in what's going on in Southern Illinois. They've got a great Instagram page, but not the same guys as Rockwell Brewery. Yep. Um, so make sure you check them out, show them your support, visit Beer Me, uh, figure out how you're going to get your favorite local beer with these new restrictions. MarylandBeer.org has all the updates at a news post on the front page, so you can check everything there. And if you have questions, shoot them to us, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, email, all of it. We're there. See you guys soon. Love you both. And uh, we'll check in. Everybody who's watching, have a great weekend. Thanks, Jimbo.